And ladies and gentlemen, welcome this evening. Good to see you. Our online people have joined us. They were waiting patiently at home, thinking, are you all ever going to finish eating so we can have Bible study? Uh, we finished eating now, and uh, we're ready for Bible study, and we've had a, uh, a good time eating. Now for Bible study. <laughs> Uh, but before we do, uh, let's see, Sunday, we've got a regular schedule on Sunday. Uh, I need to, I have not decided my sermon yet. This is July 2nd, uh, so, but we're going to unlearn something. I'll figure out what we're going to unlearn on Sunday. In our 945 hour, we are going to be talking about uh, modern Jerusalem, so there'll be some interesting things there. We'll include the Western Wall on that little virtual and uh, biblical tour, 945. And then we'll unlearn something at 10.45, and then we'll go to the Walker's house at 4.30 and uh, have hamburgers and hot dogs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, next Wednesday, by the way, is a uh, regular schedule. As a matter of fact, next week we're starting Dinner Around the World, Dinner Around the World, and all summer long, well, July, August, September. We, this is Taos. We have to push our summer, a month, you know, to get there. So July, August, September, we are doing uh, dinner around the world. So we'll have, you know, Chinese night and Indian night and Mexican night and Italian night and French night, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it'll be fun. That starts next week, but it is Independence Week, and we couldn't do like Russian food or English food, heaven forbid, for those of you who are Englishmen. Uh, so we we started our dinner around the world with uh, Southern American food. That we got really creative. We're having fried chicken next week. <laughs> so uh, that'll that'll start the dinner around the world. We're starting kind of close to home, and then we'll get more exotic as we go. We got Greek food on there. Uh, uh, just we'll have we'll have some fun through the summer on uh, all of that and. Uh, go through September on that. But uh, anyway, now we come after a word of prayer to Mark chapter 1. And uh, look at there, I got it all just on uh, two pages right there. Even had a little extra space at the bottom for you to have notes. That means that I had a little extra space on the bottom for you to take notes. That's all that means. <laughs> uh, will that mean I finish on time or finish late or finish early? Stay tuned. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we're most grateful for our wonderful little tiny church and the fellowship that we have here and those who join us online and uh, the fellowship we have with them uh, at a distance. And we know that uh, uh, we've got many of our own uh, going to be doing some traveling this week and others, uh, friends and family that will be traveling as well. We pray your safety on all of those that uh, we know and, and uh, care for as we come into this holiday weekend in the United States anyway and just... Uh, Pray that it's a wonderful time for, for family and for memories and celebrations. And as we uh, continue to worship and serve you through uh, Vacation Bible School coming up and uh, all of the other activities of, of summer and then later our, our Branson Conference and our Taos Prophecy Conference and these things that will take place, ask that they be uh, rich and meaningful and honorable to you in Jesus' name. And we've been going through Mark. We are now up to session number six, and we're going to make it through verse 34 of the first chapter out of 16 that uh, we've got. And uh, we will, uh, last, last week, uh, we saw Jesus casting out the man with the unclean spirit, as it's called in the Gospel of uh, Mark. Uh, we know that he was demon-possessed because from the other Gospels. Unclean spirit means he's got a demon. Uh, and uh, tonight we're going to see some more demons a little bit. Uh, we're going to save some of those for next week. But uh, my uh, premise, I guess I will say, is that Mark comes along, not unlike Matthew and Luke and John, comes along to introduce Jesus as Messiah. They all have a little bit different twist, perhaps, in how they present Jesus as Messiah, but they want their audience to know Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. So Mark starts out introducing him in the very first verse. Let me introduce you to the beginning of the gospel of uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
he's, he's son of God, he's Messiah. And John the Baptist, you know, they have the, the, the heavens opened up, you know, thou art the son of God. Last week we had the demon uh, who says, you know, I know who you are, you son of God. Uh, and so there's these testimonies. Now, if you are presenting someone as the son of God, they've got to have some proof, right, that you're the son of God. Or, to put this a different way, if you're presenting someone as Messiah, they need to have messianic credentials. Well, this was kind of handy and kind of good because messianic credentials involved uh, fulfillment of prophecy. And so the Messiah has to come and fulfill prophecy. There were some, there are some today, who uh, question the messianic credentials of Jesus Christ. And typically what they will do is say, well, Jesus just studied those prophecies and then did the things that was necessary to, to make it look like he was that person. Uh, you know, like rising again on the third day. Uh, <laughs> things like that. Uh, it, you know, obviously, they would say he didn't rise again on the third day. He, in fact, he didn't even die. He did, just made it look like he was dead. And on the third day, he would rise again. That would be... My, my wife wouldn't say this about Jesus, but she's suspicious about everybody else famous who dies. Um, and uh, it's always, are they really dead? Are they really dead? Are they really dead? Well, this is what suspicious people do. Uh, they ask these kind of questions. So, okay, he, he, he formulated everything. Well, uh, what, what Mark is going to do is give us so many convincing proofs that by the time you're done, you say, this guy's the Messiah. He, his resume says Messiah all over it. And so here he is. And um, he's, he's giving us, for us as readers, he's giving us the, the, the journey of his own people receiving him as Messiah and rejecting him as Messiah. We're going to have both of that in the Gospel of Mark. And here we're going to start with receiving him. So uh, he, he, he came at first, you remember, and cast out the demon. Messiah, one of the credentials of Messiah is you have to have control over spiritual forces. Right out of the bag, he showed control over for, uh, spiritual forces. As he uh, uh, took out that demon, they were all amazed in so much as they questioned among themselves, saying, what new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth even the unclean clean spirits, and they do obey him. The word right there, authority, that's the second time it's come up uh, already. This is in the 27th verse. We're going to begin in the 29th verse. But uh, it, it, he wants us to see uh, authority, authority displayed quickly, distinctly, powerfully, unquestionably. Jesus just comes in and does it and takes care of it. So that's the authority that uh, he is dealing with. And uh, so then the commentary came about uh, in verse 28. Immediately his frame, fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Okay, here's a man who, can, who has authority over demons. Now we come into uh, verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Uh, you know what's going to happen, don't you? That uh, Peter's mother-in-law soon, soon is going to be healed. And so he moves from authority over spiritual forces to authority in one area of physical forces. He's going to show us a lot more areas of physical force, but here is the uh, physical reality of sickness that we're about to be introduced to. And uh, Mark is going to say, hey, here's, here's a guy that can go from authority to authority, from demons to sickness, you name it. He can handle it. He can come at it. Have you ever been in the uh, presence of a true professional and like immediately you can tell this guy knows what he's doing or this lady knows what he's doing i remember the first time i went to an nba basketball game i was uh probably already old i was certainly a grown man had kids and all that and somebody uh, had tickets and said, hey, you want to go to the ball game with me? And so we went to, uh, uh, down in Houston, we went to the uh, ball game. And uh, I was just amazed how they made it look like a ballet. 
I mean, everything was so smooth and, and uh, just meticulous in everything that they did. It wasn't like McCurdy High School. Uh, and you immediately, just looking at that, said, these guys are professionals. <laughs> they can do it a lot different than anybody else can do it. I think what, what Jesus, he was, he was so much in authority, so skilled in what he did, that, boom, they could just immediately tell Messiah right there. That this is Messiah, no doubt about it. Uh, and I know that our mind is, but I want us to unlearn it, even though this is not the unlearned series. I know that our mind is, everybody was real skeptical about Jesus, whether or not he was the Son of God and he was the Messiah. I think what Matthew, Mark, and Luke present, John comes at a different uh, uh, an angle, but what Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to present is right out of the get-go, they were ready to crown Jesus as King of Israel. Uh, he's the Messiah. We're ready to take him. And so put that in the back of your mind as we go with it. But they, uh, they, they came out of the synagogue. Of course, we talked about that. That's where they were. Uh, so it's the same day. It's still the Sabbath day. They were in the synagogue, uh, demon cast out. Now they come out of the synagogue. They, and uh, forthwith, they entered. So there's the parenthetical when they were come out of the synagogue. So forthwith, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Uh, all, three gospel, all, all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mention this incident, which I think says to me that uh, this, this is a pivotal moment in messianic ministry. Uh, they mention both of these, going into the synagogue, casting out the demon, and then going to Simon Peter's house and healing his mother-in-law. Uh, these are the, uh, you know, Boom, boom, one, one, two, right out of the box kind of uh, issue that you got. Interestingly, the first miracle of Jesus turning the water into wine, only the Gospel of John mentions that. Uh, this is the first miracle that the other three Gospels uh, give. So forthwith, they entered into the house. Now here, you couldn't tell it so much, but in Luke, you can definitely tell it that forthwith means it's right, to, it's a stone's throw. You, you, you don't have to you know, go to the next county or walk around that Simon and Andrew happen to live Boom, right there out of the synagogue. Uh, a, a number of weeks ago in our virtual tour of Israel, we talked about Capernaum and we talked about uh, the, uh, what is believed to be the, the site of the, rema- uh, of the, of the site of St. Peter's house. And it is forthwith from the synagogue. You know, we know exactly where the synagogue is. We think we know where Simon Peter's house was. You can go back to that to, to, to see why we think that that, Simon Peter's house. But uh, anyway, it's just uh, literally it is forthwith. Simon Peter nearly lived on the steps of the synagogue. Uh, So they come out, they go into uh, the house of Simon and Andrew. Now, we, we know, I may get myself ahead a little bit, we know that Simon is married because he has a mother in law here in just a moment. We don't know anything about his wife. We really don't know anything about his mother-in-law. Uh, but this is the home of Simon and Andrew. They are brothers. So it looks like, uh, you, you could, you'd probably have to argue strongly to argue against this, that Simon and his wife and Andrew and his wife, I don't know, and the wife's mother all are living in the same house. Uh, you know, it could just be that they gathered together there because it was the Sabbath, but it lo- you know, it's the house of Simon and Andrew. What, what does that mean? Uh, you know, I like to, when I read the Gospels, especially or any historical account, it's kind of fun to see uh, what sort of cultural tidbits can you pick up that aren't really a main part of the story, but uh, hey, it's there. I don't think it would be surprising to find out that, uh, as, as in much of culture anyway, down through the ages, that People shared houses. People lived sort of uh, together. I I would guess that this is a fairly decently large house, but a lot of people live in it, Uh, and they're all family that uh, live here. So they come out, uh, and and they're with James and John. Of course, James and John are brothers also. Looks like that James and John must live in another house or other houses, whatever it may be, uh, of Zebedee. 
they come. Now, we don't really know, and last week I spent a lot of time on the pronoun they, but we don't really know who all went in the house, they. So they were come out of the synagogue. Well, there was a lot of people in the synagogue. You know, did they all come in the house? Uh, it, it, I, I would guess from the way this is written that uh, Jesus and Simon and Andrew and James and John went in the house. The others are out in the street. They're, they're there, they follow Jesus because Jesus just did this amazing thing, but they're probably not inside the house uh, just due to space and whatnot. The, Simon's house is the same one that later on there was a crowd in there and they had to open up the roof to let the guy down through. So, you know, it, it, it could be that his house became... Uh, hey, you know, come one, come all. Uh, whoever can fit, you know, make it in. So maybe there is a lot of people in there, but certainly we have those anyway. So Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever. Did you know that mother-in-law is, uh, I think, five times in the Scripture? Um, three times, it's this story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Two times... It is in the uh, account of the last days when brother shall turn against brother, daughter against mother-in-law happens to be there. Uh, and that's the extent of mother-in-laws in the Bible. That's it. That's it, Kay. That's it. <laughs> uh, so here it is, uh, Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. Now, that, it, it, it's, uh, that verse is fairly self-explanatory, and so you might say, oh good, he's not going to say anything about that. But no, no, I am going to say something about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about some linguistic intrigue in this uh, particular verse. Uh, in addition to, this is one of the five times you have the mother, a mother-in-law mentioned, but she lay sick of a fever. Well, obviously we don't know exactly what disease that is or what, what uh, infection that is or whatever, but it's caused her a fever. The word uh, fever, uh, pyros, I forgot, I put it on the outline, I think it's pyros. We get all of our py pyra words out of it. And uh, if, you, uh, if you look it up and it's uh, P-R-Y something, it probably, not, not always, but it probably has something to do with heat, like even Pyrex, right? You stick that in the oven, it's going it's to go uh, fine. Pyromaniac uh, or pyrotechnics. All the, it, it, that has to do with some fire somewhere or at least some heat somewhere. Uh, Pyros, she, she, she lay sick with a fever. She was, she was really hot. Okay, there's no, no better way to put that. She had a fever. Um, but something I want to point out that is important elsewhere, not so important here, other than here we can see it very easily. If you were reading this in Greek, uh, lay sick of a fever. The word fever right here, in fact, I'll, the, full, the whole phrase there, of a fever, is actually a verb in the Greek. It's not a verb here, but it's a verb in the Greek. Uh, and it, it, I guess if you were literally to translate the Greek, it says Simon's fevering mother-in-law. Simon's fevering mother-in-law. Now, that's not very good English. Uh, so Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever is the best way we can do it. Now, what, the, the reason I want to point out is because fever, a verb, and it's a participle. Participles, almost always in English, get an ing. Fevering, running, speaking, inspiring, educating, all those ing words um, is a participle. But, you have to be careful on a Greek participle not to take it as the implication of something that is necessarily ongoing. What a participle often does in Greek, it can mean ongoing, uh, but what it often is in Greek is an adjective. A, 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 a participle becomes an adjective. So, fevering means 
she was feverish. You know, she had a fever. It's just, it, it describes the person. Here's the reason I bring this up. We had a, a sermon on it a couple of weeks ago on the three stages of salvation. If you remember that when we were unlearning, uh, uh, justified, sanctified, glorified. And often the theologians say, I was saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. And my point was, let's quit repeating that theological mantra because it's not, not really true. They take the I am being saved, sanctification, to be progressive sanctification. You know, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm progressing, I'm working on the way. And we talk about all the dilemmas and problems with that. But it's very common, uh, again, if you just look up on the internet, three stages of salvation, you'll find I was saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. And often they will point to, uh, uh, the, to, to, the, to the verb. Uh, you could go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. You can't do it in the King James, by the way, because the King James translator is New Greek. But in all the other translations, second, uh, in fact, I'm going to go there so I can tell you what the other translations say. Uh, but uh, we've got uh, 2 Core 2, 14. There we go. Uh, now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh... Uh, that's the wrong verse. Oh, it's 2.15, I'm sorry. You might want to change your outline to 2.15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and them that perish. Them that are saved. Just, I, I suspect, every other modern translation of any use anyway says in them that are being saved. In them that are being saved. New King James does it, New American Standard does it, ESV does it, NIV does it, uh, them that are being saved, 2 Corinthians 2, 4, 15. Now, it is true that it's a participle there, and that's why they translated it that way. They got it into an English participle, one participle to another participle. That sounds like the thing to do, right? The being saved. The problem is participles serve as adjectives. So King James recognized this and said, them that are saved. That's what you do with a participle. Just like she had a fever. <laughs> Not she, she's being fevering, <laughs> being feverish. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it describes them right there. And so that's what they did with it, them that are being saved. Now, the, 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 uh, the point being that if we get back to uh, verse 29 here, uh, verse 30 here, she lay sick, fevering. When, when you uh, hear an example from the preacher who says, now this is a participle and that means that blah, 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 blah. Just, just, just put a little, a little string on your finger, wear it everywhere, a string on your finger that says when the preacher talks about participles, make sure he's talking about it right. <laughs> because often they will use that to convince you of something that is an ongoing, not yet completed kind of thing. It's happening right then when that's not the way a Greek participle is used. They're taking English participial rules and laying them over onto Greek, and that's the wrong thing. So uh, the, uh, the, the, the two linguistic oddities are, uh, number one, that's a participle. Number two, they use the word anon. Anon, they tell him of her. And how many of you have used the word anon today? <laughs> uh, it's not a word we use, anon. Again, a lot of people would look at this and say, so what we should do is update it, because nobody says anon. Anon, they tell him of her. I Honestly, I think it's much cheaper and easier just to get people a dictionary, uh, say, you know, look it up, <laughs> see, see what anon means. And, and honestly, I have never said, you know, anon, I'm going to, you know, this or that, anon. What it means is immediately, right away, right here. I mean, if I looked at that, I'll, I'll just uh, testify of my ignorance. First time I read it, I was like, mm, 
anonymously, they told her. <laughs> they, did, they, they sent him a note, unsigned. She said, <laughs> love your friend. I have a friend who. <laughs> What's anon? Uh, it just means immediately. Actually, if you look up the word anon in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the definitive uh, uh, book on English, uh, uh, if you look up the word anon in Oxford English Dictionary, it literally, yeah, I, I have the internet version, it goes on forever. Uh, these little words are the sticklers, uh, and it talks about how it came together from an and on and all this kind of stuff, but, but basically it means right now, <laughs> immediately, quickly. Uh, they tell him of her, you know, as soon as, they, as soon as they get in the house, here she is fevering, and boom, they tell, they, that, that's the first thing. Uh, not, you know, take off your shoes, make yourself comfortable, would you like a glass of tea? No. Mom's sick, <laughs> uh, is what they come out, uh, out uh, with, anon. Now, uh, why did King James choose to use anon there? I'll tell you what I think because the King James was written to be read. Remember that in 1611, books were just kind of coming out. Not, uh, rich, rich people had books, that was it. Uh, not everybody had books. You didn't have books lying around like we have, uh, you know, all through this room there's books. Uh, who knows how many books are in this room? Uh, that wasn't that world. Most people didn't have books. Uh, so, the Bible was read publicly, and the king recognized we need something that can be read and understood. Part of verbal rhetoric is making it sound good, right? Now, uh, anon is actually, believe it or not, I'll even highlight the word just to make you feel better. There you go. That is one of Mark's favorite words. He uses it over and over again. As a matter of fact, the word is used 80 times in the Bible, 40 of them in Mark. Half the time you ever see this word, it's in the Gospel of Mark. And, believe it or not, we've already had the word many times going up through verse 30. And we've even had it tonight. And we're not done with it. So... If you've got one word that comes 40 times in 16 chapters, and you, you say that word the same way every single time, that doesn't make much variety to the ear, right? And if you don't have variety to the ear, you lose interest, you drift, you fall asleep, you whatever. And so uh, I think the King James says, hey, we, I gotta use this word uh, a little bit differently. Let me back up here forthwith. Anon and immediately, all the same word, <laughs> uh, the same Greek word, that is. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I think in the very first week uh, we talked about uh, this word, euthos is the word, uh, and when he came out, up out of the water in the baptism uh, session, that's when we talked about it, because uh, Jesus uh, immediately came up out of the water. Uh, so Mark just uses this word over and over again. So Mark wants to um, tell us, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna analyze, I didn't analyze where in Mark it is. Like, does he use it more in the beginning than he does in the end? I, that's a curious thought, I'll check it out. What I think Mark wants to do is say, this is the Messiah, and let me tell you how quickly he came out of the gate, and just, Immediately, immediately, over and over and over. Uh, he's, he's sort of, he wants you to be out of breath as you go through this, to say, this is what's happening. Now, Mark went through it quicker than I did. Anon is not my favorite word. <laughs> so, uh, here he comes. Uh, she lay fevering, lay sick with a fever. They tell him of her, and he came, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered to them. Again, that's, uh, that's all pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, Mark's, Mark's playing in his speech, so here she comes, you know, he helps her up, fever's gone. She's not fevering anymore. And, uh, and, and this happened immediately. Again, anon, forthwith, right away, quickly. Uh, this is what happened. This is, by the way, characteristics, characteristic of 
Jesus' miracles, also I would say characteristic of biblical miracles, there is one that we'll look at before we're done in the Gospel of Mark at the Pool of Siloam in which Jesus uh, healed the blind man, but you remember he opened his eyes and it was kind of fuzzy first. You know, I see men, but they look like trees or something like that. Uh, that's the only time it was not an immediate miracle. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. But this, that, that's, that's true, I think, wherever you go in the Bible. When you had miracles, it was just, shoo, there it is. Cut and dried, no question about it. This happened. It's a miracle. So the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Uh, ministered, by the way, is one that uh, we would often, especially in the American setting, this is not even so much true in the British setting or the, the European setting, uh, but in the American setting, we maybe not even so true in the Canadian setting, because, you know, they have the minister of, the government ministers, right, uh, minister of this and that, and we don't have ministers, we have secretaries. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in, in the U.S. anyway, minister almost, in our, in our common world, minister is a word that's used for church. That's, that's where you minister, you know, I'm the minister, all those kind of things. It sounds a little formal uh, for those of us free church people, but nonetheless, if you, if, you, if you went down to the plaza down there, said the word minister, yeah, you know, could someone, could someone minister over here? Is there a preacher around? We need a preacher. <laughs> that, that's the connotation it would give. Here, it, it's not that connotation, but I'll give you a clue. You're going to be so smart linguistically when you leave tonight. Um, in the English language, if you have the word to, or here it's unto, to after minister, it's always the mundane, non-religious kind of ministry. Uh, so ministered to them. That means she cooked supper. Well, she probably didn't cook supper because it was the Sabbath day. So uh, supper was cooked. She served supper. That's what she did. Um, uh, as uh, she uh, ministered unto them. Interestingly, uh, the word uh, is, uh, if you want one more interesting thing, I didn't put this one on the outline, but uh, the word is, uh, uh, I, f I forget the exact form of it, but uh, I'll use the one you know, diakonos. We get deacon. She deaconed them, served them, ministered to, to them. That's always a little bit of inconvenient fact when you go to arguing that the only men can be deacons. I happen to be one that says men should be deacons, not women, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, this is not a good argument for my case here, just to be fair and balanced. Uh, she deaconed them. <laughs> she deaked is what she did. This is, uh, this is, it, it's a, it, it really is a very, I hate to use the word mundane again, we're supposed to have variety in our ver verbosity, right? So if you're going to be verbose, at least be Varietous. <laughs> so she, uh, she ministered unto them uh, right away. Obviously, there's a lot of jokes there, you know, like um, good thing now we have a woman to come. We, they'd have gone hungry. Couldn't have, couldn't have done it. <laughs> so uh, she ministered to them. Verse 32, at even, that's evening, at even, when the uh, sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and them that were possessed of devils. Okay, diseased and demon-possessed. That's the two things that have happened. He cast out a demon, and he healed a woman of disease, and now everybody who's demon-possessed and everybody who's diseased, they bring to him. First of all, it's kind of interesting to me that there appears to be a group of people who are demon-possessed. Uh, you know, uh, if uh, my theology is not really big for demon possession in this day, but even, even before I had this theology, I would think if you run into, a, you know, one demon-possessed person, that's, uh, that's, that's, 
that's a lot more than normal. And if, if, if you gather them in a line, that's amazing. <laughs> Where's all these demon possessed? possess people coming from what's up with that so he get they gather and then that are diseased that's not so much of a problem to understand in any community of any size there's going to be some sickness obviously some fever some disease all those kind of things uh, but they gathered them together we don't know the numbers i'll talk about that in a moment uh, but something that is significant when did they do it at even when the sun did set okay it had nothing to do with the heat of the day it had everything to do with the day of the week remember it's the sabbath they're in the synagogue, first of all, uh, but typically, probably, the demon-possessed and the sick stay home. One demon-possessed guy didn't because he was there in the synagogue, but these people weren't there. Uh, afterward, on the Sabbath, they go out to Simon Peter's home. That's not a problem. Jesus heals and casts out demon on the si demons on the, on the Sabbath day. That's not a problem. Uh, healing was never prohibited in the Torah. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, life is very valued in the Torah, so uh, that would have been a fine thing. You're not breaking the Torah. But what we see here it looks to me like this is a religiously observant Jewish community. And they are going to wait until the sun goes down, but they're also a community that, you know, loves their mother-in-law, loves their, uh, their, their neighbor, loves their friend, loves their family, who are diseased or demon-possessed. And just as quick as the sun goes down, now we can run, we can pick them up, we can carry them, we can get them uh, here. And they're not even going to wait till morning. They, 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 they recognize this. This is part, going back to what I said earlier in the service, looks to me like it was a, a, a real, uh, a, a very quick acceptance of Jesus as either he's Messiah or he's certainly candidate number one in our eyes, for Messiah. And so they, they go and they get, uh, again, those that are demon-possessed. In fact, how popular was this? All the city was gathered together at the door. Uh, they're still, again, at the si home of uh, Simon Peter, and uh, they are all, all there, all the city. Now, I don't know if that's a figure of speech, all the city. Uh, you could use it as a figure of speech, or is it literally all the city? I don't, I don't really have a problem if you want to say literally all the city is there. Because, first of all, it's a Jewish community. And this was, again, even Jewish communities today. They, they tend to live, well, if you go to an Orthodox Jewish community in the Bronx or in Miami or in Jerusalem, wherever it is, uh, pick you an Orthodox uh, Jewish community, everybody goes to the Sabbath on the synagogue. It's not, you know, what do you think? Do we want to, uh, we were there last week, do we have to go again? In an Orthodox community, everybody is there. So this is that kind of community. Add that to not only is everybody there, but guess what happened today? Oh, Bubba, demon-possessed Bubba, <laughs> you know, he's healed now. We, 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 we saw Jesus cast out that demon. And... Simon Peter's mother, remember, she was fevering. She's not fevered anymore. She's serving tables, and word spreads. And so they go, all the sick people that couldn't go, all the demon-possessed people that uh, uh, couldn't go, wouldn't go, whatever, they go get them and say, come on, there's a special going on in town tonight. We are getting there. They're not going to miss it. So I wouldn't be surprised if literally all the city was gathered together. But I don't think it destroys the argument if you take that as a figure of a speech e e either. And, you know, that there happens to be, uh, you know, a, a mother with young children who stayed home because it was bedtime. Whatever. It, uh, it, it could happen either way. Uh, but certainly it's, it tells of the quick fame of Jesus as they come and gather at the door. Now, remember that uh, if, you, if you go and when you go to Capernaum with us, it's not really a big place. Uh, it's, it's actually, you know, uh, I don't know. I would guess, just from looking at the ruins, that 200 people live there. Uh, maybe, I, I saw one estimate as high as 1,500 people. I, I don't think you'd be able to go much higher than 1,500 people, uh, say, live in Capernaum. So this is not a big place anyway. And it, it, it would be easy 
on something like this, all the city gathers together. And what happens when they gather together? He healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. He healed many and cast out many. Take that as a quantitative word, not a comparative word. That is to say, how many did he heal? Many. How many did he not heal? I don't know. It doesn't say anything about that. <laughs> so don't take, he healed many, but not all. That, that's, that's not what it's saying. It's just, he healed. There, there was a lot of people there he healed. There was a lot of people there that he cast out uh, demons, many sick, many devils. Uh, and uh, by the way, the word demon, you, you might say, why did they use the word devils instead of demon? Because the word demon didn't come into the English language until later. Uh, and uh, they were called devils at that point. In fact, the word demon was borrowed from Greek. The Greek word is daimon. And later Bible translators just began to transliterate it instead of translate it and made demon instead of devil. Uh, but uh, like, like we still have some King James people around because you go to Santa Fe and they got the sun devils. Or is that Espanola? It's the demons in Santa Fe. It's the sun devils in Espanola. Excuse me. See, they got the devils in Espanola and the demons in Santa Fe. And boy, do they have them. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it, it, it used to be that devils, especially with a plural, devils, uh, the little devils, is the same thing as demons. Uh, and, and at that point, the, there was no English word. Their job was to translate, and so they did it. Okay, so healed them, cast out uh, the devils. And this is interesting. Suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. That's a, it's a little bit of a perplexing deal, especially that... I don't know, you kind of want people to know who you are. I know who you are, thou son of God. Remember one of the devils said that in another place. Uh, so what's, what's wrong with this? There is a, a, there's an issue with the word because there. Be, because, you can take because two ways. You can take it as the cause, which would be its standard way, or you can take it uh, at the, the actual Greek word under, underneath because, you can take it as the word that, that, T-H-A-T. If you looked up that word, it's a very common word, but it's uh, it, easily its number one translation is that. So you can take this to say, he suffered not the devils to speak that they knew him. In that, in that translation, and either one works in Greek, in that translation, the devils might have said something, but they can't say, I know who you are. He did not permit them to do that. Uh, why? Well, uh, my guess is, and it's nothing but a guess, my guess is that he did not allow them to do that because he wanted them to come to their own conclusion. I don't, I don't want the early announcement here of uh, who the Messiah is. But even later in this chapter, before we're done, he is going to uh, do some things that others are going to go out and want to announce, and he is going to begin saying, don't announce it. Don't tell anybody. We'll get that a lot, including next week. Don't go out and tell anybody. And not even just demons. I mean, just people. Don't go tell people who I am. And that it's, it's probably a twofold thing again. One, I think, because he wants people to come to the conclusion themselves. And two, because it's not time for him to be crowned king yet. And the momentum is going here for the coronation. And he's got to kind of tap this down a little bit. But uh, he, he didn't, I, I, I think probably, he suffered not the devils to speak about knowing him. Could they talk about the weather or about, you know, political parties or whatever? I don't know. Uh, but the one thing they couldn't say is, I know who you are. Uh, and maybe they couldn't say anything. Now, the, some people, some of my...
staunch King James only friends, and uh, I always have to put the little footnote, I would rather have a staunch King James only friend than a anything goes in the Bible friend. Uh, at least they have some conviction, even if I don't agree with them on everything. Some would say, oh, ball-headed preacher, you cannot say that King James could have gone another way. You are messing with, with, with the, the good book there, if you say it could be understood this way. But, for those of you who are my staunch King James Version only friends, the King James translators themselves put a marginal note, and they said, because they knew him, or that they knew him. So they gave us permission to take it either way. <laughs> the good translators did. And it's because the Greek really can go either way on this. It is an interpretive matter on uh, how you do it. Uh, but I think that's uh, what we've got. So Jesus is off to a strong start. Uh, they, the, 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 the whole town of Capernaum at least knows him. Next week, we are going to pick up in the morning while it was still uh, day, and uh, they, they, uh, er everybody's all men seek for thee. Uh, they're all going to come and uh, try to find him, look for him, and he is going to leave Capernaum, go off to some other places and uh, show them. So uh, we'll talk about that one week from today on July the 5th, uh, next Wednesday. But so far, if you're looking for a guy that's got the resume of being a Messiah, Jesus is the one. Release to the captives, that's one of the things he's supposed to do, casting out these demons. Uh, Isaiah, I didn't bring it up, but Isaiah, is it 61? I think it's in the uh, outline there. Isaiah talks about the coming messianic age in which nobody in the city is sick, uh, and uh, here... By the time you get to this, this day, now Isaiah was actually talking about Jerusalem, but by the time you come to the end of this day, nobody in that city is sick. You know, they've all been healed by him. So he is showing, hey, you know, if I can do it in Capernaum, could I do it somewhere else? As a matter of fact, let's go somewhere else, and let me show you I can do it there too. And then he's going to say, and I haven't shown you how I can control the physical world as well. Anyone want to go for a walk? Out on the sea? Let's go. <laughs> and, and so he's, he's more and more showing them these messianic proofs. Okay, now I'm done, I promise. Let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're grateful for, for the word and uh, for the, the fact that we can take it uh, slowly, deal with some things that uh, certainly are not life-changing or that we don't set our doctrine on a lot of these little, little things like the word anon, uh, but it is... Um, uh, intriguing and good for our brains, and uh, and so the opportunity we have to take the Word of God and be enriched by it in numerous different ways, we're blessed by it. Thanks for the uh, challenge today, and thanks for the display that your son gave as Messiah. We here uh, certainly believe that he was the Messiah. We pray that things like this even would help us to uh, convince others that uh, he's not only the Messiah, but now he's come as the Savior of the world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. We'll uh, see you men for breakfast and uh, see you ladies on Sunday. Yes, ma'am. Ruth. Ruth. Oh, I get it. Mother-in-law in the Bible. Yes, but she's never called her mother-in-law. And actually, it's in the Greek that only comes five times. <laughs> That's... I didn't look in Hebrews. So, okay, so, so there is a Hebrew mother-in-law. We'll, we'll have to expand our repertoire. Yes, you're right. She was a great daughter-in-law. You're right. Yeah, it, 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 I think you're right. It clearly does. It just doesn't use the Greek word. Therefore, I'm still right. <laughs> I'm, now I've got to go look up the Hebrew word and see how many times... Hebrew mother-in-laws uh, are in the Bible. Uh, there, there may be five of those, too. Who knows? I'm going to look it up. Stay tuned, mothers-in-law. <laughs> God bless you all. We'll see you.